If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder and violence. We also apologize in advance if we mispronounce any names in this episode. The two customers waited at the counter, perplexed. Philip Enowitz and Ronald Golick had walked into Bailey's restaurant at 1.25 a.m. on August 8, 1959. They were looking for coffee and maybe a bite to eat, something to fuel them as they sailed out into the deep, dark water. The two weren't Long Island locals. Enowitz hailed from the Flatbush neighborhood of Brooklyn, while Golick made his home in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. They'd come to West Hampton on Long Island to fish. During the summer months, visitors flocked to the island to cast their nets and lines for fluke, sea bass, and cod, according to Fishing Booker's Complete Guide to Fishing on Long Island. But instead of finding a hot breakfast at Bailey's, these two would-be fishermen found a deserted diner. According to Newsday, one of the men yelled, How about some coffee? at some point. Nobody came rushing with a flustered apology and a pot of java. The only sign of life was a single plate of eggs, long gone cold on the counter. Others might have left at this point, chalking up the odd incident to bad service. But Enowitz and Golick seemed to sense something was very wrong. I wonder if they'd been recommended Bailey's Restaurant specifically. After all, they were staying at Bailey's Motel, 150 yards down the road. That was owned by local businessman Irving Bailey. The Bailey family had once owned a turkey farm in the area, but moved into the tourist trade as vacationers flocked to the island, according to Dot Berdinka of the West Hampton Beach Historical Society. Irving Bailey had recently sold Bailey's restaurant to his sister, Irene Courier, and his brother-in-law, Edward. They'd opened the diner just six weeks ago. Bailey might have been helping his family out by sending lodgers their way. Or maybe Enowitz and Golick were just savvy gentlemen who found the silent, empty diner ominous. Either way, the two tourists started to search the place. When they opened the door to the women's restroom, they found the reason why no one had come to serve them. The body of a woman was lying there on the floor. This was 50-year-old Irene Courier. She had been robbed. She had been bound with strips of cloth torn from an apron and a scarf. And she had been murdered. The New York Daily News ran a photo of Courier. The photo shows a woman with friendly, dark eyes and a big hairstyle that was in fashion at the time. She's all made up with nice earrings to match. The Daily News also actually ran a very upsetting photo of her corpse. 
Nowadays, a crime scene photo like this wouldn't run in most mainstream publications. And for good reason. It feels like a callous choice, one that strips the victim of dignity. Don't look it up. I'll go ahead and just describe it to you. In the photo, Courier is wearing what we'd call retro glasses and a pale dress that appears to be a waitress uniform. Her clothing looks disarrayed and dirty. There appears to be a ligature mark on one of her wrists. Around her neck, someone has tightly tied a bar towel that the police later said was likely used as a gag. In the black and white picture, Courier's dark hair blurs into the smear of blood on the floor. The man that Long Island newspapers dubbed the Mad Killer had struck for a third time. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercover crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're the murder sheet, and this is The Other Long Island Serial Killer, part two. Remember, if you haven't listened to last week's episode, please check that out. In part one, we discussed the first two murders in this series. And next week, we'll talk to John Jay College professor Robert McCree about this case's shocking conclusion. As we mentioned last week, Anya and I visited Long Island following the path of the killer. We told you about our jaunts to Islip and Smithtown. Now, let's tell you about the disastrous run to West Hampton. At the time, I thought I was pretty clever. I couldn't for the life of me find an exact address for Bailey's on newspapers.com. Somehow, through a lucky Google search, I found a 2010 article from the Southampton Press saying that Bailey's Motel was bordered by Old Country Road, Nadine Drive, and Seabreeze Avenue. The Bailey family apparently shuttered that motel in 2002. Well, I'd read in a Daily News article that the diner was 150 yards away to the east. The eatery was also said to be based right alongside the Montauk Highway. So I figured we should just shoot for the approximate location of the motel and then walk away following a compass app to see what we could find. Well, the punchline is that neither of us are directionally savvy. So even with the help of Google Maps, we somehow overshot the place where Bailey's once stood. By a lot. I blame myself. I was the one researching the location. I've also spent time out on the North Fork, so I should have realized that we went too far when we swung past Riverhead and kept going for a while. As it turned out, I'd plugged in a filler address that led deep into the South Fork we ended up adding quite a bit of time to our trip. Plus, we lost the light. The sun was setting by the time we arrived on some narrow residential street, lined with patches of forest and big houses wrapped in Christmas lights. Now seems like a good place to mention that this last crime took place far to the east of the first two. West Hampton is about 35 to 45 minutes away from Islip and Smithtown, according to Google Maps. 
It's situated on the south shore of the island, facing the Atlantic Ocean. It's technically a small hamlet based in the town of Southampton. Today, the Hamptons in general are known for being a ritzy, star-studded vacation spot. But we wanted to know what the place was like back in 1959. In researching this case, we reached out to a few historical societies. Eventually, we heard back from Dot Berdinka, the collections manager at the West Hampton Beach Historical Society. She was helpful and informed, and pulled quite a few articles for us. Her husband John actually grew up in West Hampton, around a quarter of a mile north of Bailey's Restaurant. As it turns out, John said he'd popped into the diner to buy cigarettes the day of the murder. Dot told us she scolded him, as he was only 12 at the time and had absolutely no business smoking. The night of the killing, he and his pals were camping out in the woods nearby, within walking distance of the restaurant. This is a bit confusing, but West Hampton isn't the same as West Hampton Beach to the southeast. That's according to Dot Berdinka of the West Hampton Beach Historical Society. West Hampton doesn't have a quaint main street lined with charming businesses. In West Hampton, Dot wrote us, Montauk Highway was the equivalent of our main street. The businesses that would have been around Bailey's Restaurant would have been a popular eatery called Jean's Famous Sandwiches, a mini golf course and driving range ran by that same Jean, and a large field left open for Jean's airplane sightseeing business. John recalled to his wife that he once saw a plane plummet and belly land in the cornfield across from his house. After the murders, John said that his 12-year-old self wasn't scared. His parents had a shotgun and were confident that they could protect their family against any roaming killers. But the murders did make him sad, as he'd known Mrs. Courier to be a really nice lady. A lot has changed on Long Island since 1959. But I'll tell you, visiting the area where Bailey's once stood at night felt almost like stepping back in time. Despite our earlier setback, we managed to reach the place where the motel had stood. And, as luck would have it, around 150 yards to the east, we found a seafood restaurant. From what we could see, it seemed like it could exist on the spot where Bailey's once was, although we can't be totally sure. When it comes to this place, the one descriptive word I want you to come away with is the following. Darkness. Even in 2020, after six decades of development, the darkness around this place was thick. There was some kind of automotive business across the highway with its own set of bright lights. But the rest of the area is just trees, fields, and the black ribbon of highway. Now, let's jump back in time to that summer of fear. Reporter Ben White covered the serial killer story extensively for the New York Daily News. On August 9, 1959, he published a story breaking down the known facts of the Courier slang. Irene Courier had sent her employee, a waitress, home at 10.30 p.m. After that, she was left totally alone to deal with any late-night diners. At some point, the killer came in and ordered eggs, scrambled. He tied his victim up and tried to strangle her. When she fought back, nearly getting one hand free, he shot her in the left temple. Then, he stole around $100 from the register, missing the nearly $200 left in Courier's purse. John H. Nugent, the coroner, estimated that Courier died around two hours before Anna Winston Golick stumbled into the scene. Making her time of death around 11.25 p.m. on August 7, 1959. The Southampton Police Department was tasked with investigating the killing, and police across the island wondered whether the killer had a knowledge of law enforcement procedures. They felt that he might have intended to create a jurisdictional snarl by moving from town to town. 
But let's not move on too quickly from the tragic murder of Irene Courier. Her brother's motel was close by, but help must have seemed so far away on that deadly night. Police called Courier's husband, Edward, from his home in West Yapank. He identified her body and then collapsed. They'd been married for around 23 years. Edward was a bartender. Irene was a waitress. They'd never had any children. Opening their own eatery had been a dream for them for a long time. And a few weeks into operating their own place, the worst happened. It's just a nightmare to think about. At this point, police were on high alert. Sure, some of the details of the Courier case were different. This victim, unlike the others, was bound. But there were enough similarities. A solo worker in a Suffolk County eatery late at night or early in the morning. A sloppy robbery that missed a stash worth hundreds. A 32 caliber murder weapon that investigators saw a connection almost immediately. Long Islanders came forward with all sorts of tips. The press even pitched in. Ben White of the Daily News, who we've cited a few times, called in a tip. A source named Hilda Gaines said she had been working her farmer's market booth with her daughter Mary. A strange man came up and asked the young girl if she needed silver. Then he promptly walked away. His hands had been full of coins. Nothing came of that tip, or the tip from Bill Cruz of Oyster Bay, who saw a man at the Roosevelt Raceway with a paper bag stuffed with money. Anticipating another murder any day, the Smithtown Police Department upped its patrols, assigning squads to keep close observations on diners and eating places that were open all night. But Smithtown Police Chief Cyril Cy Donnelly realized that this wasn't going to be enough. He called for a conference of all county officials to better coordinate the patchwork effort of each town guarding its own businesses. Of course, what Chief Donnelly and all the other investigators working this case knew was that catching the killer would be the fastest, surest way of restoring the safety of the island. And, shortly after the Courier murder... That's exactly what happened. At some point, the name Francis Henry Bloth came up. Frank Bloth was a 27-year-old construction worker who lived in Islip Terrace, a hamlet in the town of Islip. Bloth appears to show up in Detective Sergeant Robert Cavanaugh's notes around August 12, 1959. He's listed as a white male around 5'10", and 180 pounds. From what we can tell, a man named Robert Walsh called in the tip that named Bloth and cracked the case. Robert Walsh was a 23-year-old career criminal from Islip Terrace. The photo of him that ran in Newsday shows a floppy-haired kid with deep-set eyes and a nervous expression. Walsh had a frightening story to tell cops. He'd previously sold Bloth a 32 caliber revolver in June of that year. Suddenly, in August, Bloth said he wanted to buy a new gun. The transaction went through, but Bloth made what Walsh felt was a sick joke about having killed two men in Islip and Smithtown. I thought he was kidding when he told me he'd killed those people, Walsh said, according to a Newsday report from Tom Renner and Don Drake. But several hours later, Irene Courier was dead. When I read about the West Hampton job, I got scared and figured I'd better call the cops, Walsh said. So he went to the police with his story, even though he ended up getting busted on gun charges. Police arrested Bloth on Monday, August 10th, 1959. They hauled the prisoner into the district attorney's office where Walsh identified the man as Bloth. Detectives found the shirt Walsh told them he'd used to wrap the automatic in, in Bloth's car. On August 11, 1959, Detective Kavanaugh and investigator for the district attorney's office, David McKell, 
swooped down on Bloth's home at one Irving place in Islip Terrace. They searched the two-bedroom apartment Bloth shared with his wife, Jane, and their baby daughter. In our files from the Suffolk County Police Department, we received a blurry, typewritten list of items seized from the residents. We won't bore you with the entire list, but it includes three boxes of garbage, lots of items of Bloth's clothing, a copy of True Adventure, seems to be some kind of men's magazine, a small flashlight, a silver plastic water pistol, and two leather gun holsters dumped in the garbage bin. 25-year-old Jane Bloth apparently told investigators that her husband was at home during the first two murders. She also said the holsters were for her daughter's water pistols. But detectives knew pretty quickly that the latter claim wasn't true. One holster appeared to be specifically designed for an automatic. But the search warrant didn't turn up any other signs of the missing thirty two caliber guns. Stories about Bloth began to spread around Long Island, and detectives ran some of them down. Police in Smithtown received a tip that may have been about Bloth from one Carlos L. Norris, a 27-year-old from North Carolina who worked as an attendant at Pilgrim State Hospital. On August 17, 1959, he gave a statement about an incident that had happened that June. He was driving around at 2 o'clock in the morning with two friends, Leonard Reed and Carol Horsfield, crammed into the front seat of his car. It's not clear whether they were just messing around on a drive or whether they were reporting for work. They pulled onto Pilgrim State property and saw a figure in the darkness. It was a woman named Barbara. Again, it's not clear how they knew her. But they could see she was shaking, crying, and so they pulled over. Barbara told Norris the two men offered to give her a ride home from Pat's bar in Brentwood. But something bad had happened. We imagine it was some kind of an assault, although the details are not spelled out in the report. But that wasn't all. Barbara told Norris and his friends that the men still had a girl with them, a girl named Frances. They'd taken her out into the woods, Barbara begged Norris to go find the girl named Frances and pointed out the direction the men had driven in. Norris ended up letting his friends out and driving alone down a dirt road on the east side of Crooked Hill Road. At some point, he had car troubles. His car's clutch pedal was stuck to the floor. When he sat back up, he was looking into the barrel of a gun, a silver revolver with a white handle from what Norris could tell. The strange man holding the weapon ordered Norris out of the car. He told me to get out of here and placed a gun to my head, Norris wrote. I told him I couldn't go because my car was broken down. I then reached up with my left hand and pushed the gun away. He told me that he really meant business. He raised the gun over his head and fired one shot in the air. He told me to sit here until he got away. In the meantime, Francis got into my car. The strange man and his companion then drove off, leaving Francis with Norris. Norris ended up bringing Francis back to Barbara, but the two women begged him not to report the matter to police. As you can tell, it's a murky incident. There's lots of dark space to fill in the blanks. To me, it sounds like some kind of sexual attack against the two women. But it's not entirely clear how this upsetting incident made it into the Lawrence Kircher case file. Norris told the police that he couldn't be sure the man with the gun had been Francis Bloth. But there were other, more concrete sightings, too. The wife of Lawrence Kircher, the second victim in the Mad Killer series, also recognized Bloth. Zella, or Patricia Ann Kircher, the records aren't really clear, worked at the Portion Road Diner in Ronkonkoma. She told police that on August 4, 1959, Bloth had come into the diner around 10 p.m. and ordered a cup of coffee. He sat there, watching the steam slowly fade. Then, he abruptly left. 
she ultimately recognized his face when his photo ran in the newspaper. To think that she'd been working around the man who'd coldly shot her husband to death. Retired New York City detectives Joseph Marino, Joseph Brown, and Thomas Montgomery all backed up her story. According to an August 12th report from Smithtown Detective H. Dwyer, Michael Ramoska of the Lake Diner in Ronkonkoma also filed a complaint against Bloth. Apparently, a man who looked just like Bloth had barged into Bill Bollert's local delicatessen. The doppelganger really creeped out the woman working at the counter. So Bill Bollert actually pulled a gun on him and ordered him to scram. The guy who looked like Bloth apparently excused his behavior by saying he was an auxiliary policeman, flashing a badge and his holstered gun, before he left. But who was Bloth when he wasn't being a public menace in Long Island restaurants? Well, the young man had a troubled past. He was known for shooting cats with a BB gun. He once even strangled one to death with his bare hands. Bloth's parents said that he'd been a good little boy until he pitched head first out of an apple tree at age seven. The 30-foot fall left him with a concussion, according to the New York Daily News. Shortly thereafter, Bloth apparently became an out-of-control child. At some point, his mother Mary Bloth had him declared a juvenile delinquent. He ended up spending time at the state reformatory in Warwick. A director there told the Daily News that Bloth was a psychopath. As an adult, he spent stints at Bellevue Hospital and Kings County Hospital, two mental institutions, for a total of 11 years in state and parochial institutions. He underwent psychiatric tests nine times. Bloth's attorney, Sidney R. Sibbon, would also tell the Long Island Traveler slash Mattituck Watchman that the Bloth family had a history of mental illness. Before the murders, the defense also found that Bloth had been in a car accident that they cited as a possible reason for his worsening behavior. But, according to an August 20th, 1959 article in the Long Island Traveler slash Mattituck Watchman, Bloth confessed that his life of crime dated back before the murders. He was on a continual crime spree whenever he was out of jail, his attorney Sibbon told the paper. He claimed responsibility for a number of assaults and robberies in Nassau County and Suffolk County, but not any other murders. Suffolk County District Attorney John P. Cohalan essentially told the paper that he personally did not care about any non-fatal attacks. We have enough to do with checking out these three murders, he said. But despite his history of violence, Bloth's wife Jane said he also had a charming, gentle side. He'd wooed her and made her feel loved early in their relationship. He even bought a harmonica to play lullabies for his baby daughter. Jane is an important figure in this story. In his Heads and Tails segment for Newsday, columnist Jack Altschul wrote a bit about her. Jane had had a hard life herself, starting with being born in a mental hospital. Jane was separated from her twin brother at birth and then shuttled between foster homes. She strived to educate herself and became an avid reader. When she became addicted to dope while working at a nightclub in Greenwich Village, she'd put herself through rehab and got sober. It was Greenwich Village where she first met Bloth, who'd wooed her. At first, she turned him down, but eventually she went out with him. The two were married on August 21, 1957. According to a Newsday piece from Tom Renner and Pat Gilmartin, Jane, who was Jewish, once asked Bloth, who was Catholic, if he wanted to have a Catholic wedding ceremony. He angrily declared that he came from the elements and stormed out of the room. And one of the most disturbing incidents came about on the day after the slaying of Hans Hackman. Jane said that Bloth came home with all the newspapers, which were all covering the murder. 
Whoever committed this is having a good time and getting a lot of headlines, her husband said. At that point, Jane tried to suppress the suspicion that her husband could be a vicious murderer. But cold doubt continued to creep in as August stretched on. After Bloth was arrested, something broke inside Jane. She lied to alibi her husband. But on August 14th, she sat down with Bloth for two and a half hours in a cramped room in Islip's town hall. Earlier that day, the Daily News reported that he talked to a Catholic priest for about 40 minutes. Then he came face to face with his wife. At first, Bloth kissed her passionately and proclaimed his innocence. But she pressed him for answers. Tell the truth, Frank, she said, according to a report from William Murtha and Sidney Klein of the New York Daily News. For me. For the baby. Photos ran in the papers showing Jane after she left the meeting with her husband. They capture a pretty woman with dark, curly hair and hoop earrings. She wept and stood hunched like a great weight had been cast over her shoulders. Jane told reporters that she'd stick by her husband because she'd married him for better or worse. But her mission that day had been successful. The petite 25-year-old had pushed Bloth to confess to his crimes. He gave cops a full confession for each of the three murders. He also admitted that he was casing an Islip bowling alley owned by a father of five named Maynard Chill, who later said he'd seen Bloth hanging around the joint. Bloth even confirmed that he was planning to kill Rudy Feicht, the scrappy restaurateur we told you about in part one, who'd slammed the door in Bloth's face. Bloth told police he was a danger to everyone, with the exception of his mother, his wife, and his baby. Every other living person was fair game. At no point did Bloth show one iota of remorse for his rampage. He earned decent money through his construction jobs and seemed to be up to date on his bills. He told cops, I like to kill. He was a cold fish. Bloth's own attorney, Sidney R. Sibben, stormed out of the confession in disgust. The man must be insane. No normal person could kill and talk about it that way, he told reporters, according to an article from the Daily News. On August 15, 1959, a manacled bloth was shuttled from Islip to the Suffolk County Jail in Riverhead. Meanwhile, police started trying to find his murder weapons. He assisted with the search for the automatic gun he'd tossed into Lake Ronkonkoma. So did Ben White of the New York Daily News, who called Chief Donnelly on August 17th to share a source's tip. A man named Frank had called in to say that while swimming, he'd seen a gun in the water. He offered to meet the cops outside of Freed's restaurant in Smithtown to lead them to the weapon. It's not clear which lead ended up panning out, the one from Bloth or the one from the mysterious swimmer. But either way, they found the gun. One photo that ran in the New York Daily News captured the successful search. In the picture, patrolman Bernd Carlson and Detective David Menzies stand shirtless and chest deep in dark water. Menzies holds some sort of pole, while Carlson, in a snorkel mask, holds up a 32 caliber gun he just pulled off the bottom of the lake. This was the gun Bloth had used to kill Irene Courier. But authorities didn't have such luck when it came to finding the revolver. Ben White and Jack Smee reported for the New York Daily News that Smithtown and Suffolk County assembled a crew of highway workers to search for the other missing weapon with mine detectors. They also pulled Bloth out of his cell to search a wooded part of Hop Hog for the gun. But... According to Newsday, they never found the revolver. With his confession out in the open, Bloth continued to get his kicks by needling the press. He's quoted in the Daily News and Newsday as saying stuff like, 
If I had more bullets, I would have killed more. Give me a thirty-eight, and I'll wipe out all the reporters for you. I'm putting on a pretty show, ain't I? And, when appearing before Justice of the Peace, Alfred E. Freeman, I wonder what Fatso would do if I pulled a gun on him. Ben White and Jack Smee of the New York Daily News reported on the aftermath of Bloth's arrest. Tensions were high in Suffolk County. One person even called in a lynching threat. Police didn't take it too seriously, given that it sounded like a prank call, with jukebox music crackling in the background. Still, they doubled the number of guards stationed at the jail. But none of that pressure seemed to get to Bloth. Nothing did, really. The New York Daily News quoted him as shooting the breeze about the summer weather with the guards. It looks good and hot out there. I bet the beaches are jammed. At that point, his wife and daughter were far less unscathed. As a result of Bloth's crimes, they were evicted from their apartment at one Irving place, despite keeping up with rent payments. It's not that I have anything against her personally, landlady Mrs. Andrew Galazzi told White and Smee. But this trouble has become a source of embarrassment, with cars driving up and down the street all day and night, and people bothering the neighbors with questions. Now that police had built their case against Bloth, it was time for the district attorney's office to take over. The Patchog Advance reported that Cohalan had impaneled a grand jury to indict Bloth for the murders. Witnesses called to testify include a few figures we've introduced you to already, including Diane Diner manager Joseph Lauer, the witness who found Lawrence Kircher's body, Wilfred Booten, Kircher's son Lawrence Jr., the tourist from Brooklyn, Philip Inowitz, Irene Courier's brother Irving Bailey, three pathologists who examined the victims, and officers from the police departments of Islip, Smithtown, and Southampton. The same article mentioned that Walsh, the star witness for the prosecution, the man who had handed over Bloth, signed an immunity waiver and was free on bail. Over the course of the fall of 1959, experts examined Bloth to see if he was legally insane. On September 3, 1959, the Patchogue Advance reported that Dr. Hyman S. Barahal, who ran Pilgrim State, said his institution wasn't secure enough to hold Bloth, although he did recommend two psychiatrists who would be able to scrutinize Bloth. Sibbon, Bloth's attorney, was also permitted to engage his own experts, but Bloth didn't seem to appreciate the implication. I told him of my plans of offering an innocent plea by reason of insanity, and he tried to attack me, Sibbon told the Patchog advance. The deputies had to hold him back. He screamed at me, Nobody can call me crazy and get away with it. On September 7, 1959, the grand jury handed down four indictments against Bloth. When the accused murderer was arraigned by Judge Lloyd P. Dodge, Bloth's attorney, Sibbon, instead offered a plea of innocence by reason of insanity. I want to plead guilty. Why can't I plead guilty? I'm going to get the chair anyway, Bloth shouted in response, according to the Long Islander. In November of 1959, Bloth fired Sibbon and replaced him with a defense attorney named John Clark. The trial began in the spring of 1960, when a jury of 12 men was assembled in Suffolk County. Proceedings went forward in the county where Bloth had run wild, despite concerns from the defense that the jury pool was tainted by extensive press coverage. The trial was for the murder of Irene Courier only, and featured two counts of first-degree murder, one for the premeditated killing and the other for felony murder, as the slaying occurred during a robbery. A count of first-degree robbery was also thrown in for good measure. The defense wanted to make a case for Bloth's innocence by reason of insanity. They conceded that Bloth had killed three people, but argued that he couldn't understand that what he was doing was evil. 
The prosecution felt that this was just a weak excuse for a brutal man. The district attorney wanted to send Bloth to the electric chair in what would have been the first death sentence handed down in Suffolk County in 30 years. Keep in mind that nowadays most trials, even murder trials, are relatively sedate affairs. Impassioned arguments and explosive cross-examinations are mostly the stuff of television shows and movies. But if you've ever watched Anatomy of a Murder, which is a terrific courtroom drama starring Jimmy Stewart that was based on a novel Michigan Supreme Court Justice John Volker wrote under the pen name Robert Traver, you know that trials used to be significantly more theatrical. I must protest this. This is a cross-examination of a murder case. It's not a high school debate. Ironically, Anatomy of a Murder was actually cited in this case. In Newsday, Cohalen said that he would question jurors about their knowledge of Anatomy of a Murder, given that the book and movie feature a temporary insanity defense. He didn't want members of the jury to watch the movie and get inspired. Once the trial got underway, Newsday reporters Art Bergman and Tom Renner would quote D.A. Cohalen as saying things like, I say to you, gentlemen, he has forfeited every right to remain a member of the human race. I ask you, in the name of the people of the state of New York, to send him to the death chair where he belongs. It's intense stuff, but the families of Bloth's victims seem to agree. I hope to see him murdered, Irving Bailey, brother of Irene Courier, told Newsday. I hope to be able to go up and see him burn. Art Bergman and Tom Renner of Newsday also reported remarks from Clark, Bloth's defense attorney. Clark exhorted the jury to find Bloth insane. This is not temporary insanity. It is an underlying present virulent mental illness. He has it today. He'll have it tomorrow. It hasn't cured itself. He flatly refused to discuss mental disorders. It can only be apparent by this that he would rather die than admit mental illness, the attorney said, according to Newsday. But Cohalen urged the jury not to buy the defense's theory of the case. How nice to be insane when you wanted to be and kill some people, the prosecutor said, according to Newsday. Don't listen to this slop about how his little daughter is going to grow up worrying about what happened to him. Give a little thought to Irene Courier. If you have any sympathy, don't give it to Francis Henry Bloth. Give it to Irene Courier. She didn't have five seconds to compose herself for death. Jane Bloth didn't testify at the trial, according to Newsday. And Cohalen made use of that fact. There are two women I would have liked to see here, he said, according to Newsday. One is Jane Bloth. If she could have benefited Bloth's defense, she would have been called. The other is the disembodied spirit of Irene Courier. After the defense and the prosecution made their closing statements, the jury of Bloth's peers was left to ponder the facts of the case. According to Newsday reporters Tony Schaefer and Tom Renner, the 12 men deliberated from 11.45 a.m. Friday, May 13th, to 11.45 a.m. Saturday, May 14th. At that time, they declared Bloth guilty, and they didn't recommend any mercy either. The following Monday, Bloth was sentenced to death. The family members of the victims expressed their satisfaction with the verdict. I think he got what he deserved, Irene Courier's husband, Edward, told Newsday. If I'm allowed, I'll go to the execution. I would like to pull the switch on him myself, Hans Hackman's wife was quoted as saying. D.A. Cohalen told Newsday that he was glad it's over. But the thing is, it wasn't over. We'll talk more about the odd denouement of this case next week. That episode will include a conversation with John Jay College professor Robert McCree regarding this case and restaurant murders in general. Special thanks to Dot Berdinka, her husband, 
and the entire West Hampton Beach Historical Society for their help and insight. A lot of the details in our show also came from a Freedom of Information request with the Suffolk County Police Department. Thanks to the SCPD for sending all that over. For this episode, we relied on reporting from the New York Daily News, specifically journalists Ben White, Jack Smee, Sidney Klein, and William Murtha. Articles from Newsday reporters Art Bergman, Don Drake, Pat Gilmartin, Tom Renner, Tony Schaefer, Paul Leventhal, and columnist Jack Altschul also contained a lot of great details. We also included information from the Associated Press, The Long Islander, The Long Island Traveler slash The Mattituck Watchman, The Patchogue Advance, The Southampton Press, and The Suffolk County News. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on the Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to the Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure and send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.